think, I think right, right now. Um, first of all, I would like to thank Burju Aldous for the invitation. And uh, those of you who are listening, hopefully it will be useful for you all. Um, today, I would like to talk about identifying cancer biomarkers using integrative analysis of single cell and bulk sequencing data. Um, currently, I'm in uh, University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston. I'm working as an assistant professor here. And if you are planning to apply for master's or PhD, please uh, feel free to uh, contact me. And if you are looking for postdoc positions, also please feel free to um, email me. Okay, let's start. Um, so first I would like to give uh, uh, the outline of my talk. Um, I would like to first give a brief introduction into cancer biology. And then I would like to talk about my previous projects where we tried to integrate genomic, transcriptomic, and epigenomic analysis of brain tumors. Uh, we generated lots of bulk sequencing data and we did all these integrative analysis. Um, uh, under these projects, first, uh, we tried to characterize benign uh, meningiomas. And uh, next, we tried to understand the molecular mechanisms involved in the formation of primary atypical meningiomas. And finally, we tried to understand the malignant transformation of IDH1 mutant gliomas. And on the second part of my talk, I would like to briefly talk about integrating genomic landscape of the tumor cells with the transcriptomic landscape using single cell uh, RNA sequencing data. Um, let's start with the introduction, cancer biology. Um, as you all know, uh, tumor cells are uh, composed of different clones, and each of these clones have different driver events, and all these driver events can be either genetic or epigenetic. Uh, we might have clones that might uh, have fitness advantage in the context of treatment. Uh, we can have clones that ha can give um, uh, relapse or that can, uh, uh, that can give relapse to metastasis. Um, so understanding all these um, driver events in those different uh, tumor clones is very crucial, especially in the context of um, precision medicine. Um, as you know, cancer is a disease of genome. Uh, we can have single nucleotide variations uh, or indels in the genome. We can have uh, substitutions, insertions, or deletions. And all these alterations might uh, change uh, protein activity that can lead to uh, abnormal protein uh, expression, that, and that can initiate the cancer. We can have copy number variations or structure variations. Uh, on the bottom, on the uh, left, you see the karyotyping plot. Uh, in this karyotyping plot, you can see that in cancer, we can have chunks of the genome uh, deleted or chunks of the genome amplified, and that might lead to overexpression of the oncogenes or uh, deletion of tumor suppressor genes, and that can initiate cancer. We can have structure variations that include transversions, translocations, transversions, uh, inversions, and all these events might um, lead to fusion genes, and uh, fusion genes uh, can uh, create some uh, abnormal protein activity. It can have, uh, we can have a very high expression for oncogenes. Um, we said cancer is a disease of genome, but uh, it's also a disease of epigenome. Uh, it has been shown that uh, epigenetic alterations can lead to cancer initiation or progression. Uh, we, uh, it has been known that, for example, uh, DNA methylation can lead to uh, abnormal transcriptional regulation, and uh, histone modifications can change the 3D uh, structure of the genome, and that can also uh, lead to abnormal uh, protein activity. Um, but thanks to next-generation sequencing, we can uh, understand the uh, transcriptomic, genomic, and epigenomic landscape of the tumor using uh, whole genome sequencing or whole exome sequencing, we can uh, get insight about single nucleotide variations, copy number variations, or structural variations. 
using RNA sequencing or microRNA sequencing, we can get insight about um, protein, but mRNA gene expression or small RNA gene expression. We can understand the structural variations. And using DNA methylation or chip sequencing, we can get insight into um, epigenomics. Um, but the thing is, this data is really complex, and we need integrative analysis to really uh, understand this data. Um, so developing uh, complex uh, algorithms or integrative analysis uh, is very crucial to get some meaning out of this data. Um, so now I would like to talk about um, the project that I was involved in when I was working at Yale as a, a resource scientist. Um, first, um, we I would like to talk about uh, uh, character. I would like to talk about characterizing benign meningiomas. Um, first of all, what's a meningioma? Meningioma is the most common type of tumor that forms in the head, and over 35% of all primary brain tumors are meningiomas. Uh, a meningioma is a tumor that arises from the meninges, and what's a meninge? It's um, the three-layer membrane uh, that protects the brain and the spinal cord. And uh, although most are histologically classified as benign, about 10% of meningiomas are atypical or anaplastic. And in this project, we tried to understand the benign uh, grade 1 meningiomas. Previously, it has been uh, reported that NF2 mutation is one of the driver mutations in meningiomas. And in this project, we tried to understand all the other driver mutations in uh, non-NF2 mutant meningiomas. Uh, and uh, in order to do that, we did uh, exome sequencing, whole exome sequencing, and targeted sequencing for uh, hundreds of uh, meningioma tumors. And on the left, you see this, uh, you see the oncoprint of this uh, sequencing cohort. Each bar represents one sample. And on the, on the columns, uh, you, sorry, on the rows, you see the driver mutations that we identified using uh, exome sequencing and targeted sequencing. As I said, NFT mutation was previously reported, uh, but we identified um, other driver mutations in meningiomas, such as SMARTB1, TRAF7, AKT1, PIK3CA, PIK3R1, KLF4, SMO, SUFU, PRKR1A, and POLAR2A. And uh, these, interestingly, these um, these driver mutations form mutually exclusive uh, subgroups in benign meningiomas. Uh, when you look at the patterns, NF2 mutants are mutually exclusive uh, uh, from TRAF7 mutants and PIK3 mutants and hedgehog mutants and polar tail mutants. Um, so. Uh, Finally, we were able to summarize meningiomas based on five main driver mutations. We have meningiomas that have NF2 mutation. We have meningiomas that have hedgehog pathway mutant. We have meningiomas that have TRAF7 and KLA4 mutant. We have meningiomas that are TRAF7 and PIK, PI3K pathway mutant. And we have meningiomas that have POLAR2A mutant. And, uh, we observed that TRAF7 and KLF4 usually um, uh, co-occur, and TRAF7 and PI3K pathway mutations also co-occur. And uh, the good thing about these uh, groups were that hedgehog pathway was uh, the most interesting uh, group uh, because previously uh, um, researchers developed drugs for uh, targeting hedgehog pathway, so uh, it was uh, clinically interesting. Um, in this part of this project, the most uh, challenging part was differentiating driver mutations from passenger mutations. Um, and in order to do that, we did lots of uh, uh, different annotations. We annotated our mutations um, uh, based on uh, whether they are uh, deleterious or non-deleterious. We 
looked at different statistical measures such as uh, deleterious versus non-deleterious mutation count in the gene, uh, recurrent mutations, uh, or uh, uh, domain uh, protein domain hotspots uh, in the gene, or um, we also did some permutation analysis to really uh, identify the driver mutations from passenger mutations. And then finally, after you uh, get this uh, list of driver mutations, you have to have also uh, um, Sanger sequencing validation. Um, and the other interesting part of this project was that we were able to correlate the mutational profile with the anatomical position. We have seen that um, NF2 mutants are mostly on the uh, are mostly on the skull base, and all these other KLA4, AKT1, Polar2A, and small uh, mutations are on the um, sorry, I, I said wrong. NF2 mutations were on the uh, cerebral hemisphere, and all these others were on the skull base uh, part of the brain. And that was the most um, interesting part. Uh, uh, especially in clinics, because when you look at the MRI, uh, you can classify the mutation type based on the location of the tumors. Uh, we also looked at copy number variation uh, in those tumors using genotyping and whole exome sequencing uh, data. Here you see a circus plot. And uh, in circus plots, what you see is that each circle represents one sample. Um, we in this plot we grouped our samples based on their driver mutations and uh, the blue lines means that there's a deletion and the red lines means there's an amplification and as you can see from this plot um, chromosome 22 uh, is recurrent uh, deletion among NF2 mutant tumors uh, they are uh, genomically unstable, NF2 mutants are genomically unstable, but all these other non-NFT tumors were genomically stable. Um, so, as I said, we tried to identify copy number variations from genotyping, but we also tried to identify it from whole exome sequencing data. We had some samples where we had uh, whole exome sequencing data, but we didn't have genotyping data, so we had to infer um, copy number variation from the whole exome sequencing data. Even though uh, genotyping is the most uh, standard way of identifying CNVs, we were also able to identify CNVs, copy number variations from whole exome sequencing data. Um, as I said, uh, chromosome 22 is the recurrent subgroup specific deletion uh, in NFT mutants. Um, so we tried to identify copy number variations, CMEs, from whole exome sequencing data. It's a challenging task because when you look at this plot here on the left, uh, you can see that log ratio of tumor versus blood depth of coverage uh, signal is very noisy. When you try to call CNVs using the signal, then you would end up with lots of false positive CNV calls. Um, so in order to have a more accurate CME calls, we did joint analysis of log ratio and BLL frequency shift. Um, as I said, on the left, you have the log ratio signal. And on the right, you have the BLL frequency um, shift signal. And here in this BLL frequency shift, you see that there's a shift uh, here on 1P and chromosome 18, um, and sorry, chromosome 19 and chromosome 22. Um, so when we do the joint analysis, we can see that uh, the uh, true CMB events, oops, the true CMV events here in the sample is 1P deletion, uh, chromosome 19 amplification, and chromosome 22 deletion. Uh, sorry, chromosome 19 deletion and chromosome 22 deletion. Uh, we also estimated admixture rate uh, using uh, BLL frequency signal, uh, and we estimated it using the degree of deviation uh, from homozygosity. And uh, in addition to copy number variations, we also looked into gene expression. And uh, for that, we did uh, microarray gene expression. Uh, we had uh, different samples coming from different mutation subgroups. 
we had uh, about like hundreds of gene expression samples and uh, some were NFT mutants, some were KLA4 mutants, some were PI3K mutant, some hedgehog mutant and some polar 2 a mutant. And here our goal was to uh, get the biomarkers uh, specific for each of these mutation subgroups. And uh, the reason why we want to get the biomarkers for each subgroup is that we then want to really identify the abnormal pathways in those uh, mutation subgroups. And how did we get the biomarkers? We did differential expression analysis uh, uh, comparing uh, each of these subgroups within each other. Uh, this is the summary of the biomarkers that we identified for each of these mutation subgroups. And uh, as you can see, for example, hedgehog uh, pathway genes are highly expressed in hedgehog uh, mutant groups. We have wind pathway uh, abnormality in NF2 mutant group and uh, some more uh, interesting pathways in these different groups. We then use we then use these biomarkers to um, characterize uh, or classify new gene expression data. So as I said, we defined the biomarkers for each of these meningioma subgroups using our gene expression data, and then we build a, a random forest prediction model using our biomarkers. And when we have a new gene expression data that we don't know the uh, driver mutation, we can use our random forest prediction model to predict the subgroup of our uh, new gene expression data. Um, that was very useful, especially in uh, for, this, uh, for the samples that we uh, couldn't identify any driver mutations. We had some samples that we didn't know the driver mutation of that sample, and we wanted to understand uh, what kind of... Uh, subgroups that is more close to or uh, what other driver genes that we can find from that uh, from from that uh, tumor. So it was uh, useful in that sense. And then we looked at the super enhancers and what are super enhancers? Uh, super enhancers are clusters of enhancers in close proximity. Um, people has uh, people have identified enhancers using uh, H3K27 chip seek. Um, so we performed H3K27 acetylation chip seek on uh, different meningioma subgroups, and we called peaks, uh, uh, and we called the enhancers uh, using these H3K27 acetylation chip seek uh, signal, and we clustered the enhancers that are in close proximity, and finally we uh, plotted. Uh, uh, the enhancers, uh, the regions that are ranked by H3K27 acetylation enrichment. Uh, we ranked it from low to high, as you can see from the x-axis. And on the y-axis, we plotted the chip seek signal enrichment. And uh, the enhancers that are on the right part of the inflection point represents the super enhancers. Uh, so that means that uh, the enhancers that have very very high chip seek signal enrichment are classified as super enhancers. Uh, why did we look at uh, super enhancers? Because they have been shown previously to control cell state and identity. Um, uh, for a uh, specific cell type, uh, it has been shown that some, uh, some uh, genes are very active because they have a super, super enhancer. Uh, and uh, that's why we wanted to know uh, what kind of super enhancers we might have in different uh, meningioma uh, subgroups. And also, uh, previously, it has been shown that super enhancers were found at key oncogenic drivers. Um, so, for example, in cancer, we can have uh, super enhancers in front of MIC gene um, that uh, leads to a very, very high expression of MIC gene. And the good thing about, uh, about super enhancers is that we can uh, target them with drugs. For example, for if there's a uh, super enhancers in front of MIC gene, then we can uh, use BRD4 inhibition to uh, treat the tumor. 
Um, so as I said, we performed HDK 27 acetylation chip seek on different subgroups, on different meningioma subgroups, and we uh, uh, identified the super enhancer binding score uh, using our chip seek data. And we did when we did uh, clustering based on our super enhancer binding scores, we were able to classify meningiomas uh, into different subgroups. When we do the unsupervised clustering, as I said, it was possible to classify meningiomas into subgroups. We then looked at concordant changes of uh, uh, HTK27 acetylation chip seek and gene expression. So what we want to know is that if there is an enhancer in front of a gene, then uh, if there's a super enhancer in front of one gene, then we would expect that gene's expression to go up. And uh, similarly, if uh, there's a loss of super enhancer in front of a gene, then we would expect its uh, gene expression to go down. Um, so what we did is that we compared the gene expression between uh, polar TA mutant meningiomas versus all the other meningiomas. And we also uh, compared the super enhancer binding score of that gene uh, between polar TA mutants versus all the other meningiomas. And we looked at the concordant changes. Uh, and we were able to identify uh, WIN6 and ZIK1. Those are key identity genes in meningeal development, and they are dysregulated in polar TA mutant tumors. And what we hypothesize, hypothesize is that uh, maybe polar TA mutant tumors are derived from distinct progenitor cells that are separate from typical meningeal lineage. Uh, and now I would like to talk about another project where we tried to identify the molecular mechanisms involved in the formation of primary atypical meningiomas. Um, so atypical meningiomas are associated with poor prognosis and a 10-year survival less than 80%. Um, what's the typical meningioma? It can either uh, uh, it can either form from benign meningiomas. Benign meningiomas can transform into atypical meningioma. And if that's the case, we say that this uh, meningioma is recurrent, uh, atypical. And it can also be that uh, a normal cell can transform into atypical meningioma. And if that's the case, we say it's primary atypical meningioma. Uh, and we screened our cohort uh, of uh, progressed recurrent atypical samples and also primary recurrent samples primary non-recurrent samples, and we have seen that in our recurrent atypical samples, 13% of those uh, samples harbor mutations in the third promoter, but we haven't detected any third promoter mutations in primary atypical meningiomas. So we hypothesized that um, there can be a presence of two distinct molecular pathways, either through de novo pathway, which we are going to study, uh, or due to transformation of benign meningiomas, uh, partially through acquisition of an activating third promoter mutation. And uh, as I said, we tried to understand uh, primary atypical meningiomas in uh, this study. And in order to do that, we first looked at somatic mutations and copy number variations in benign and primary atypical meningiomas. On the left, you see an oncoprint. And, uh, you see um, the labeling of atypical and benign meningiomas. All these atypical meningiomas are primary. And you can see which ones have chromosome 22 loss. And you see the uh, driver mutation profile of these tumors. And we observed that um, most of the primary atypical meningiomas are NFT mutant. Uh, and we also looked at copy number variations. And we have seen that. Uh, most of uh, atypical samples have increased genomic uh, instability. The percentage of genome alteration is higher in atypical meningiomas compared to benign meningiomas. And these observations were really useful in designing our experiments because uh, in this project, the main challenge is that uh, when we do a simple comparison between benign versus atypical samples, then our results could be largely driven by this underlying genetic background. Um, because 
as I said, atypical tumors are mostly NFT mutant and they have an increased chromosomal aberration. So in order to do uh, appropriate uh, analysis, we have to really uh, have a very good experimental design and we, do, we have to uh, model the genetic background of the tumors in our analysis. Um, so uh, with the gene expression analysis, again, we, in order uh, to understand the genes or the pathways that are abnormal in atypical samples compared to benign samples, we didn't just do atypical versus benign comparisons. We uh, did a linear model where mutation profile and CME effects are removed. And uh, finally, when we look at the results, then we have seen that uh, we have an increased expression in cell cycle genes in atypical meningiomas, and we have abnormal uh, FOXM1 transcription factor network gene expression and E2F um, and transcription factor genes expression in atypical meningiomas. That means that there is a proliferation uh, in, uh, there's an increased proliferation in atypical meningiomas. And we did lots of other analysis that I'm not going to go into details now, but we did lots of integrative microRNA and gene expression analysis. We did lots of integrative DNA methylation and ex gene expression analysis. And we did HTK27 triamethylation chip seq analysis. And all of those analysis um, uh, told us that uh, there is an aberrant PRC2 and EZH2 activity in atypical meningiomas. Um, what's PRC2, uh, PRC2, uh, it's a complex, and in uh, stem cells, it has been shown that it reversibly represses differentiation-related genes. Uh, and EZH2 is a subunit of PRC2, and it's a, a catalytic subunit, and it uh, recruits DNA metal transferases. Um, so what we hypothesize is that uh, in atypical meningiomas, are uh, the cells are in a uh, stem cell like state and uh, differentiation related genes are repressed uh, and as i said we uh, we were able to find this uh, using all these integrative analysis we have seen increased ezh2 activity in atypical meningiomas and we have seen um, uh, decreased um, decreased LET7 microRNA expression in atypical samples, and LET7 is a known regulator of EZH2. Uh, and in DNA methylation data, we have seen increased um, EZH2 signal in uh, stem cell PRC2 binding sites. We have seen increased DNA methylation in PRC2 binding site, and we have seen increased HGK27 trimethylation binding in atypical samples. And that was more enriched in PRC2, embryonic stem cell PRC2 target regions. Um, and we have also, uh, so that's the summary slide of our findings. We have, uh, that's the de Nova, de Nova pathway in the formation of primary atypical meningiomas. We have mostly NFT mutation, and that is accompanied by either chromosomal instability or SMART B1 mutation. And we have an increased LET7 expression microRNA expression, and that might lead to increased EZH2 activity uh, and uh, increased PRC2 activity, and that leads to uh, repression of differentiation-related genes. And we have uh, an increased proliferation with upregulation of E2F2 and FOXM1 cell cycle pathways, and all these mutations do not harbor third promoter mutations. So we said that these, all these abnormalities work synergistically to stimulate cancer growth while inhibiting differentiation. Uh, and we had another study where we tried to identify the molecular mechanisms uh, involved in malignant transformation of IDH1 mutant gliomas. And that's the summary slide of this study. And we had some similar findings. Uh, we also saw increased proliferation with stem cell-like state in malignant IDH1 mutant gliomas. We have seen different um, genes or pathways that are uh, abnormal in uh, malignant IDH1 mutant tumors. Um, and th that's the only slide that I'm going to uh, talk about about this study. 
Um, and now I would like to talk very briefly talk about another project that we try to identify um, copy number variations from um, single cell RNA sequencing data. Um, you might have heard single cell sequencing. It's very popular recently and it's uh, revolutionizing the cancer research. Um, with the single cell sequencing, we are able to isolate one cell and we can sequence DNA or RNA of one single cell. Uh, the thing is, uh, single cell sequencing data, it's more noisy uh, compared to bulk data. It's more incomplete compared to bulk data. And the other thing is, uh, it uh, gives uh, really large data uh, compared to bulk sequencing data. Because now, for one sample, we can have thousands of uh, single cells that are sequenced compared to tens uh, of samples that we, tens or hundreds of samples that we have in uh, bulk sequencing. So uh, here, uh, analyzing single cell sequencing data, uh, right now it's challenging, uh, but it at the end gives lots of uh, information about the tumors. Uh, for example, when we have single cell RNA sequencing, we can get insight about the tumor microenvironment. Um, we can get the uh, uh, transcriptional signatures of different clones of a uh, tumor. Um, so here in the study, what we tried to do was we tried to infer copy number variations uh, in tumor cells using single cell RNA sequencing data. As you know, copy number variations are usually identified from uh, DNA sequencing data or genotyping data. So until now, people did not really look at um, uh, single cell RNA sequencing data for detecting CMB events. But uh, currently, I think it's really uh, interesting, and it would give lots of lots of information about tumor, because currently we don't have the simultaneous single cell DNA and RNA sequencing. And uh, if we can really uh, utilize RNA sequencing data to infer uh, genomic variants, then we can get uh, gene expression signatures of different uh, uh, tumor clones. So in this study, what we tried to do is we tried to identify mutual exclusive copy number variation clones in tumors using uh, single cell RNA sequencing. And then we uh, extracted uh, gene expression signatures of each of these uh, mutually exclusive CME clones. Um, so that's uh, the flow chart of our algorithm. Um, we first, so our algorithm called CASPER uses uh, expression values and BLL frequencies from RNA seq from RNA seq reads to estimate CME events. Uh, we first uh, generate a normalized gene expression matrix. And then we smooth the expression signal by applying recursive iterative medium filtering. And we apply uh, hidden marker models to assign and segment CMV events. And uh, we also incorporate the BLR frequency shift information to the segmented CMV events. We extract the BLR frequency signal from mapped RNA seq reads using an optimized BLL frequency generation algorithm. Uh, and for the BLL frequency signal, we again um, smooth the signal and we identify the threshold for, uh, for the shift. Uh, and we correct the CME events using BLL frequency shifts. Um, I'm just going to talk about one application of our algorithm. Uh, we applied it on single cell uh, GBM RNA sequencing data set that is publicly available. Uh, here on the top, you see um, the heat map of uh, normalized gene expression matrix where we have uh, samples on the rows and we have the genes ordered by chromosome on the columns. Uh, and on the bottom panel, uh, you see the smoothed expression signal uh, using iterative uh, median filtering. Um, as you can see, after we smooth the expression signal, uh, we can really see uh, what kind of uh, copy number variation events are happening in different samples 
in different cells. Um, as I said, here on the rows, we have different cells and uh, we have uh, different cells coming from different patients. And uh, here you can see which cells are coming from which patients. And here, for example, we have seen that there is a chromosome 5 amplification in, uh, in one patient. And most of the cells uh, in this patient has this uh, amplification. But the most interesting thing here in this analysis is that sometimes, uh, for example, here in this case, uh, some cells have uh, this, uh, some cells might have chromosomal uh, abnormality. Here, for example, we have chromosome 11 deletion for, uh, for a subset of cells in this patient. But we have another event that is happening in another subset of the cells in this patient. So we try to identify these mutually exclusive uh, copy number variation events uh, in one sample. And uh, to do that, after we do this um, uh, smoothing, we, uh, we incorporate also the BLI frequency signal um, into our analysis as I said, like in the flow chart of our algorithm, we incorporate that BLI frequency shift information also. For example, here uh, we have the chromosome 7 uh, BLI frequency signal for different samples, and we see a shift in chromosome 7, and that is also seen here in the uh, plot here that there is a chromosome 7 amplification that is, uh, uh, and when we incorporate this BLI frequency signal, then we will have more accuracy amicals. And finally, what we did is that we tried to summarize large-scale CME events using our smoothed uh, expression signal and BLI frequency signal. And we were able to identify, as I said, the mutual exclusive CME clones in, um, in uh, MGH31 sample. We have seen uh, a subset of cells that have 5Q amplification and subset of cells that have 14Q deletion. And similarly, uh, in this patient, we have a subset of cells that have 13Q uh, deletion and subset of cells that have 1P amplification. And in our analysis, we also did uh, inferring of phylogenetic uh, CME uh, structure. We inferred this phylogenetic tree of this sample. Uh, and again, uh, we can, using this tree, we can see that the three separate cells harboring 1P and 5Q amplification from cells harboring 13Q and 14Q deletion. And we also summarize those mutual exclusive uh, and co-occurrent events using uh, graph-like uh, visualization. Here we have uh, the edges that represents the significance of the uh, event pair. Uh, the blue, blue nodes represents deletion, red nodes represents amplification, and uh, if there's a, a dashed line, then it means it's, it's mutually exclusive, and if we have a solid line, then it means that it's co-occurrent. And as I said, we were able to identify all these uh, significant mutually exclusive 1P, 13Q, 5Q, 13Q, and 5 um 5Q, 14Q event pairs. And as a summary, we talked about um, uh, how we can do integrative analysis uh, using genomic, transcriptomic, and epigenomic data. Uh, and we, I also talked about uh, our other project, our recent project, where we tried to identify copy number variation events from single cell RNA sequencing data. And finally, I would like to acknowledge uh, all the members of Yale University Gunal Lab uh, for, uh, for all the projects that I mentioned about meningiomas. And also um, the part that we did um, where we tried to identify the CMB events from uh, single cell RNA sequencing data. Uh, where I would like to acknowledge um, Center for Computational Systems Medicine uh, and also Center for Precision Health uh, members. Um, that's all. Thank you for listening. I hope it was useful. Um, thank you. Uh, and thank you very much for this uh, great and very informative talk, talk Dr. Harmanje.
Uh, we have some time for some questions. Uh, you can use the chat box on the right, right hand side uh, for writing your questions. While we were talking about uh, characterizing benign meningiomas, uh, Salia Yıldızhan asked you a question. Uh, did you perform all of the analysis uh, for the same samples? Um, so uh, mostly we would uh, we try to do a con uh, to do to perform our uh, experiments on the same samples, but unfortunately, for example, for the chip seek. Uh, um we sometimes didn't have the same samples that we sent for gene expression because you know like for chip seek you need to have a, a fresh uh fresh sample and it has to have some uh some some features that we can send for uh sequencing chip sequencing so uh we tried to optimize uh like we try to match all these samples for example when we do all these concordant analysis of uh chip seek and expression or uh or uh microRNA and expression or methylation and expression integrative analysis we try to match those samples as much as we can but not all of them are matched sometimes we have some samples that we don't have in our uh, other cohort Okay. But that's important. So the thing here is that we really have to, if you have uh, a study in your, if you have a study in your mind, then you first have to do the experimental design uh, in a very, uh, like you have to think about it and you have to think about your hypothesis and perform your experimental design and then do the experiments. That would be the ideal way. Okay. Uh, is there any other questions? Uh, I think. Oh, okay. Uh, Salia Ilsan asked you, that, does your tool Casper assume a direct relationship between copy number and gene expression? Um, yes. So that's, um, so the thing is, um, um, usually, as I said, like people identified copy number variations from DNA sequencing or genotyping data. Uh, inferring CMVs from RNA sequencing data is challenging because uh you the, the like one single gene expression is not really uh really relate it might not be related to copy number variation it can be related to some gene regulation uh so here in this uh tool we try to look at more like large scale events meaning like uh more than one third of the chromosome arm uh we were also able to identify like uh, more than one tenth of the chromosome arm, but you cannot really get very high resolution uh, copy number variation events from RNA sequencing data. Um, so we uh, assume that there is, if there is a large chunk of genome uh, that have very high expression of genes, then we assume that there is a copy number variation event happening there. But uh, you cannot really uh, identify one single gene uh, copy number variation from RNA sequencing data that might be really false positive calls that might include false positive calls yeah thank you very much is there any questions I think there is not any other questions uh, okay uh, I want to thank our speaker on behalf of everyone for giving this talk and thank you all for following us and attending this webinar uh, to hear our future announcements, please follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Uh, don't forget to check out YouTube channel for the webinar recordings. And have a wonderful day and stay tuned for our next uh, uh, webinar in November. I think we will uh, make a webinar with Arif Özgün Harmanca in November. Uh, that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank much. You. Dr. <laughs> Thank you for invitation and thank you for listening. As I said, hopefully it was useful for you all. Uh, thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.